One question, an amazing lineup of CEOs, founders, and experts. This is Marketing for the Now. Can you hear me? It's the 50th. Thank you so much. That made me feel sick. Thank you for having me. I love how vulnerable Eliza for your back. So glad to meet you. Who you? You real? Seagull. Marketing for now. Gary. How are you? I'm good. Another marketing for the now. Do you know that we're going to be celebrating our third anniversary in May? Isn't that I crazy? Do, I do know that, Andrea. That is something you know I that? know. You know, we're, we're, we want to have you on for the full hour. I'm going to get, catch you live here saying that you might consider that for the full hour in May. We're going to, I, we're going to take I, a look I, at I, that for May I 9th. Might, I might consider that. Okay. All right. Excellent. Hold all on. Right. I have to say hello to Mikey D. Um, Vicky J is in the building. Louis C, uh, a bunch of great people. Art Ortega, great to see a lot. Holly, uh, see them all in the chat, in the comments, LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube. We see you all here, Ginger. Thank you for the hat comment. Um, all right, Andrea, go ahead. And we're fired up because they're all here because they want to hear about social platforms and culture and how we can be relevant with our brands today. But before we kick off with some of our favorite brands, we're going to offer uh, Zach Nadler to come on up. CEO of Vayner Speakers. We want to hear a little bit more about what's to come for VCon. So you got three minutes. <laughs> we can go yeah. quick. All right. So uh, Gary, yes. you've worked together 15 years this August. You've yes. been to over a thousand events. Yes. What makes VCon different? Um, the intent. You know, I think V Friends was created to make the world friends with each other, right? Patient Panda and Accountable Ant and all the stuff we're working on with character development, animation, kids books, behind the scenes that haven't been seen yet is trying to make the world a better place. But in the short term, VCon was structured to make people friends with each other. It was kind of like the hippiness of Woodstock, but the business nature of Davos and South By. And I think last year we needed to really just educate everybody on Web3. And so last year, a lot of education on Web3. This year, I think you're starting to see it take its form and I think the energy of the, you know, you and I talked about this last year. You were such, I mean, you were as meaningful of a human, you, Maha, and like there were six or seven people last year that had as big of an impact on that being such a winning event as I did. And you were really there and you were in the trenches and like sweating and making it happen. And then at the end, we looked at each other and said, this is insane how well this went. And of course that's like you and others who did their thing but it was also the intent of the energy of the audience. And I think it's just different. And I think anybody who's watching right now who's never bought an NFT needs to figure out how to buy an NFT ticket, get to their ass to Indianapolis, because May 18th to the 20th is gonna be fucking crazy. Yeah, so 36 days out for everyone who's not paying attention. Uh, May 18th to 20th, vcon.co slash tickets. But let's be real, last year you had Snoop Dogg on stage. You were on stage with Wyclef singing at one point with a stadium full of people, what was your favorite part about last year that like the actual thing that was going on? Was it connecting with all these people and taking 5,000 selfies? Like what really do you think people need to know about VCon that, you know, the intent was there. People wanted to be there, but why is it VCon? What makes it so special? I think my favorite part was watching my dad take all the things that people were giving to me and taking it for himself because he's <laughs> a hoarder and he loves free stuff. Um, yeah, it was just, you know, honestly, you, you know me so well that you led the question. You know that while everyone was like, you're fucking insane for, you know, standing here for six and a half hours without taking a drink of water and taking selfies. Like I want that one-on-one -on -one time with the community. But like, for me, it's like, when I think about, I'll give you a great example. Neil Patrick Harris and Drew Barrymore, two of the speakers this year. Like, I know most people know Doogie Howser or like How I Met Your Mother. I know people know fucking E.T. and Drew Barrymore. Sure, like I know that people know them, but people don't know them. Mm -mm. And it was like what happened with Jesse Itzler last year, right? Like my favorite part is that the panels that you and I have put together are banana shit. The content's banana shit. Everybody, I will talk about community and being friends with each other all day long. You know this, Zach, and you won't. we won't say it because it's going to come across you know, egotistical, but like there's not a lot of events on earth that have the capacity of the speakers we have. Uh, like it's kind of scary. And, you know, so 
What makes it different is it's one of the single best lineup of speakers in the world with a community that genuinely wants to be nice and and we were fixing like literally everything was nice last year except people bum rushing to the swag stations and running each other over because they wanted flip life or they wanted the stuff. So like now we don't have limited edition stuff but we have lots of stuff. Like we're just gonna keep making it nicer and we're gonna keep making it a better quality content event. And the one thing you said to me was afterwards, you said, all right, great, next year let's make it bigger. So we had 155 speakers last year. We're going to be close to 200 this year. So for those of you who haven't seen, we'll have another announcement for you next week with our final lineup. But get ready because it's going to be it's going to be out of control. Thanks for getting in Europe. That was a fun little plug. Nice work, Andrea. I like the little commercial in between. Yeah, exactly. The- then we kick it off with a commercial. It's the pre. You know, I never look at the schedule. I'm like, what's Zach doing here? <laughs> <laughs> but don't worry. Thank you, Zach. And next up, we've got Mark Weinstein, who is the CMO at Hilton. He oversees a portfolio of 7,165 hotels across 19 brands in 123 countries. Welcome, Mark. But who's, but counting. who's counting? But, but who's, who's counting? counting? <laughs> we like to count. You one of those McDonald's, how many burgers we've sold, uh, signs. And, and I got to up my swag game. Look at that shelf. Yeah, this is, I I mean, you're pretty that. good there, brother, but this I is I gotta, I gotta add some layers. I got to add some layers. One um, dimensional. Uh, real quick, uh, Camel, we have a new office in Amsterdam. I see in the comments. Mark, it's a real pleasure, you know, obviously being the CMO of such an iconic brand, super cool. Let's just go right into it. What is your hot take? Actually, I have a great question for you, Mark, because my team has been really, like I get debriefed on the majority of meetings and it's been interesting to see like how, you know, our team is a tough filter because we're, you know this about us. We're a very different marketing firm than the the industry. And so we come from a, like a different angle, but I've been really impressed with kind of the feedback of like the points of view of my team about you to be frank. And so like, I'm gonna ask you an interesting question based on that context. What help the audience here that's a mix of CMOs, CEOs and entrepreneurs and, and influencers and young people, what, is the disconnect between Fortune 500 brands and and like where's the element of like common sense that's mi- why do companies struggle with doing good content on social because of the corporate element what are they missing what's the gap what are you sensing what's your state of the union on creative on social is now where brand is being built but big companies are struggling to like go pot committed they're kind of half in why and yeah, this doesn't question. have to be about you. It's like just your observation. Yeah, you know, I, I think at the core of it, a brand has to be really comfortable with who they are, you know, what their purpose is and what their mission is. But recognize we have zero control of where customers want to consume information. And that disconnect, I think, is what's causing the challenge, Gary. I think brands are trying to push it out through channels that traditionally people grew up with and have believed in and known. And yet our customers are showing up in places you wouldn't expect. Do you, I, think, I also think, do you think that brands are trying to stay on brand too much and not be contextual to the platforms and the tone and temperament of yes. any consumer segmentation. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yes. I mean, our, our best marketing is when creators tell their version of our story in authentic ways, right? And instead of the brand saying, here's the script and here's how it has to be done, it has to be shot this way and the lighting has to be perfect, reacting in the moment, creating lots of content, some things will fail and that's okay too. I don't think that's the typical cycle for a, a major brand. I think it's been so traditionally sort of purposeful and thoughtful and three-year plans. And we need to respond this afternoon if something happens on social and let other people tell our story and trust that the authenticity will outweigh the brand safety concerns that come up along the way. I think, you know, at the core of your question, Gary, influence has been democratized, right? And, th- and that's the heart of what it is. We need to let the people who other folks want to hear from, hear from them. What, um, what platform or what cultural pop culture phenomenon, fashion trend, up and coming influencer, uh, the way people are doing things, TV show, like what social platform and or what pop culture thing or movement has you personally most intrigued? Yeah, you know, we did some stuff on TikTok recently and, and you know, it could be any platform that happens to be the one that we were using in the moment where the average length of viewership is a couple seconds, right? And we had the audacity to go to a 10 minute TikTok and go look for 20 times the average viewership uh, time people spend viewing. We're going to tell our story and we're going to push back and mock the form itself. And so the creators we had, the influencers we had, were embracing the the tropes and then pushing back against them. That was a lot of fun. That was a great way to tell our story and really go, we're in on the joke. You can wink and nod at the customer and go, you know, the, the viewer and go, look, we get that you're customers and also viewers. 
th that feels authentic. That feels true. I, I think where you get in trouble is when you try to teach a platform how your brand works uh, yeah. or try to pull everybody towards you. That, that, doesn't, that doesn't ring true. And what's the biggest thing that has surprised you in marketing in the last five years? Yeah, you know, maybe start with what hasn't surprised me. Great storytelling continues to win the day, right? At the end of the day, I get asked on panels all the time, what'll be next? I have no idea what technology, what platform will come next, what format it'll take. Is it voice? Is it, who cares? Great stories will win the day. And I, I think it's been a reinforcement. It, it's not about stopping people where they are and interrupting them. It's about telling stories in the way they want to consume stories. And so I love this, again, this sort of democratization of how we can it, connect with our customers. That's exactly right. It's why we're so, we, you know, we always say creative is the variable of success, but the context of what creative you have to make based on the new forms of distribution, whatever those forms may be, is where I think the industry is falling. We're, we're, we're romantic about subjective quality and format and distribution in the face of what everybody in these chat comments are living. Well said, I mean, we're grading ourselves against a scorecard we built 30 years ago as an industry. Right. And customers are going, yeah, that, that, that okay, Mark, fine, but if, that's not if, how I consume. If, if, these, if these people knew that everything in Fortune 500 marketing was still based on a book written in 1991, they would laugh. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, and how do you have enough confidence and conviction in what your brand stands for that you can let people play with it and feel confident that it'll uh, carry the day? That's been the difference for us in telling our story about you know Hilton for this day and our, and our messaging that in the world of go, 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 actually taking a few minutes to reflect and, and stay is, is actually quite powerful and the antidote to everything else society wants you to do. I think that's right. What um, what uh, what do you tell inspiring kids watching right now who absolutely want to be the CMO of a big company like you are? What was a trick of the trade? What was a hack? What was a tried and true? Who was an impact? How'd you get here from your perspective? Yeah. Look, uh, you know, grind it out. Uh, there, there is no shortcut to this. It, it's a long game. Don't try to get it tomorrow. You know, one thing I tell folks all the time is whenever there's a shiny object, everybody in the company wants to go work on that project, the new brand, the new product, whatever it may be. And that's the least successful place you're ever going to be. It has the most scrutiny on it. It has the most pressure associated with it. Go find the thing that nobody else wants to do. Stay back on goal. Go find the next project. There's more white space. There's more room to fail. And by the way, when that becomes the next big thing, you will have been in the driver's seat. And for me, that's been what it is. It's just chipping away and delivering along the way. It's having big visions of what we can achieve and what's possible, but putting wins on the board one point at a time uh, along the way. And that's how you earn your credibility and your chops, I think, in these companies, in any company. Uh, I think where folks get a little bit off track is when they try to jump steps, when they sort of worry about, you know, we'll be sitting around the table. We know our frontline analysts. We know exactly what their capabilities are, and we know who's going to be CMO one day. But if you think that way and you're worried about it, you're going to trip along the way. You're going to stumble along the way versus just doing great work day in, day out, taking the risks, being confident. And what I would say to the most young, you know, the, the youngest of our viewers, fail early, who cares, right? At the end of the day, I think we overassess the risk of taking, you know, the, the, the penalty of taking a risk very, very low early in your career, very, very low. And so take lots of risks, they can, they can perform quite well. But Mark, thank you so much, brother. Thanks for being on, continued success, and I hope you have a great summer. Yeah, you as well, take care. Thanks, Mark. Love Andrew, that last before, one. Now, that now we're celebrating epic fails all the time. I love that. I agree. Before we uh, get our next guest, I, about 30 seconds, I want everyone in the comments to say where they live and what they do for a living. The networking I'm seeing potential here on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn. A bunch of you have just joined for my tweet and my Discord post. Please also get the value from each other in this chat. So please uh, let us know where you are from and what you do. Uh, love right. it. I'm from Wisconsin. <laughs> Jersey via Belarus. All, right. <laughs> All right, it's time. Let's bring up Wanda Young. She's the global chief marketing and experience officer for Ford Pro. Ford Pro provides an integrated lineup of all kinds of things, vehicles, services, software, charging, and financing options. Can't wait to hear more, Wanda. Thanks so much for joining us. Hey, Andrea, how are you? <laughs> Wanda, love, I'm loving the pink. Yeah, I was just about to say, Wanda, did they not tell you this is not a fashion show? Like, you really brought it. I mean, this no, is like, I know. I'm so like, excited to be here, Gary. How's it going? <laughs> it's going well. It's um, actually just a sweatshirt, though. It's is it? A, that's all it is. But the hair is proper. You can get to wear what you want, right? I get it. Aren't you um, wearing a sweatshirt? I love it. Wanda, um, let's go right into it. 
you know, from your perspective, sitting uh, on top of one of the biggest car companies in the world, where is, you know- Big statement. I don't think that's quite true. Right. You have a very senior role. Yeah. One of the big vision of a, you know, a 120 year old. Yes, yes, great. Okay. I, I know you like to keep it humble, but the truth is you are sitting at a very senior level at one of the biggest car companies in the world. Um, what is what is exciting and what is challenging about the speed in which these social platforms are changing? You know, it's not just, you know, okay, there's Snap and there's Facebook and there's, you know, it's that within them, the algorithms are changing constantly, which is your distribution and awareness and the challenges creatively are changing constantly. Give us some insight to what a giant iconic company has advantages in that environment or what's extremely challenging in that environment? Yeah, the, the biggest part is like, you just have to be relevant to customers. And like, I remember talking to somebody that I was trying to recruit in and they're like, yeah, I'm a B2C marketer. I really can't come over and do this thing that's B2B. In Ford Pro, we're working with commercial customers and they buy fleets. And so we sell to like the landscaper. My electrician is actually at my house. He actually <laughs> rang the doorbell when I was supposed to be coming into this. And he he's like driving up, uh, you know, Ford Transit van. And so he's one guy with one van. And then we sell to big fleets with, you know, a thousand vehicles. So I have to look at like, who's our customer and determine, are they actually on Snap? I can tell you this guy is not who's here. Um, but some of the dealers and some of the customers that we're talking to, they're they're making TikTok videos and you know trying to highlight what's new and cool about the Lightning. So we're trying to figure out what the content's going to be that's going to be relevant to them. You're right; it is about what's going to be relevant, and because the algorithms are changing, how do we stay on top of that? And some of the things that surprise me, I posted something about an electric school bus from a work truck week event. And I was shocked at the number of sales leads and questions I was getting coming out of what I would have considered to be pretty old school in terms of who was walking through an event at something that was Indiana based called Work Truck Week. And yeah. the people who followed me on Twitter who were commenting and actually DMing me coming out of that event. And by the way, Gary, I didn't even go to the event. And it was about an electric school bus, but they're actually trying to transform how they pick up and take our kids to school. And these people are coming from San Jose, California, because they care about how, you know, they're moving their journey on electrification and they want to change. So that's the behavior change that you see happening that is um, completely transforming the way people think about content and what you would not expect about that journey of content followership, the way that they think, and um, what they want to do with their businesses. Entirely different. What, um, what about popular culture, right? So now you decide, okay, cool, like a TikTok can actually, you know, we've gotten to the era where 15 years later, even the biggest companies in the world, a Pepsi, a BMW, a Ford, a, you know, yeah. whatever it might be, they now understand, huh, this social media thing is not a toy. This can be real. So we're there. Uh, we're not fully there. I think a lot of people still think of it as an afterthought, but we're kind of there. Then you got to fill it with content to your point. How much do you think, this is actually a great question that I'm curious about your answer, but I think is going to help a lot of CMOs that watch this show. Do you think that every brand, including B2B, has permission to understand what's happening in popular culture and find a way to weave that into their communication? Isn't that a leading question? Of course it is. Of course but it is. Other than, other than you could say no. I mean, I would definitely not say no. I was at the early stages of social media working for Walmart, trying to develop them, build a Facebook page for every retail store. I mean, it has to be. The conversation's occurring there. It's got to be an integrated part of conversation. We work to put in every single plan that we're developing. And um, the reality is the conversations start there first. It's not coming through a press release. It's going to get distributed through you know, news outlets, um, it begins there. I actually try, we, we work to develop what's the customer journey and where do they begin? And oftentimes what I'm usually um, teaching the teams that we work with on, on product management is customer journey begins where? It is online. And it's gonna begin through a platform, pick one. And they're, they're starting their searches, whether it's through Google and whatever, and then map it from there onward. And that's how we start. And then we have to think through 
what are all the touch points that they're going to go through from there? So we always talk about what the customer journey is going to be. And by the way, it doesn't matter if it's B2B or B2C. It's just people. They're like, we don't market to buildings. So it is a customer conversation and how they're getting there. And, you know, um, I follow this. There's this really weird guy that I knew that was doing these wine journals. And he was talking about like a wine library. He's a really odd guy. He's been doing like a thousands of these videos over the course of the years. You might know who he was. Yeah. Um, and uh, we weirdly uh, work with the Sonoma County Wine Growers Association. And Love. you wouldn't think that wine and trucks go together. You don't drive when you're doing this. I, I mean, I do. Them. I, I've, I've, shipped, I've shipped a lot of wine around the country through trucks. Trucks are a very important part of how my wine. Yeah, got farmers love their trucks, but these wine growers, um, we started working with them as when we launched the Sonoma, um, we were launching the Ford Pro brand and we went out there. And so uh, all types of people who are driving trucks and vans are working on their journey to electrification. And they, people that you wouldn't think are beginning this conversation, but they started online across platforms and they came to us and found us by looking online saying, look, F-150 Lightning, I had to start this. And you know why? Because they want to lower their emissions footprint and they're looking to deliver um, a new way of actually doing something as old as farming and take this um, their business in a different direction. And it's all kinds of businesses, small, medium, large, government, enterprise. And so we're helping them do this. But this conversation begins with what they find when they go and look for companies and businesses who can deliver, you know, what we talk about is really just, it's a one-stop shop. And that's how we, we start the conversation with them. Interesting. What about longer form content for something that is, you know, when I think about lowering emissions and you know, electric vehicles and things of that nature. Is there, back to social platforms, has there been a thought or how do you think about or does the company think about longer form content that then gets chopped down? To your point even earlier about the school bus, the concept of in a B2B environment for all the B2B marketers here, filming the trade show to then create the clips from the conversations at the trade show to be content they're putting out on YouTube and LinkedIn um, please. Oh. oh, my electrician's here. Do you want to meet him? I'd love to say hello. Yeah. Hey, Noe. My It's scary. Do you want to um, yeah, Can I just talk to you in about 10 minutes? That's great. So, well, can I say hi to Lloyd? Well, no, he's, he just walked out, though. He's going to have to talk to Mattress. He's working on my garage store. Um, he, um, we do that a lot. We actually filmed a lot of customers when we were at the trade show. We actually just like, do an intercept and then we talk to them about their business because the whole point about getting to authentic content, um, I heard you just talking a little bit ago um, yeah. with Hilton and, and the authenticity of actually capturing like what are their real, what are the real challenges their business? They, I mean, when you talk about, um, I know you have a love for, you know, um, small businesses in particular. And when you think about what they're dealing with, we try and get behind like the real issues. I mean, we talk all the time. I I'm, go out and travel with our sales teams. And we go and visit with them about like, you know, through the, um, the, the challenges of going into the recession, fuel is a real issue as they um, are taking their trucks and vans and they have to keep them for a lot longer because of the fact that, by the way, I don't know if anybody heard, but there was a chip crisis and we haven't been able to, all OEMs haven't been able to actually deliver the trucks and vans that have been promised. So for those issues, um, it's been the rising cost of fuel, major issue. Repairs have taken a lot longer to get them in and out of all of the garages. And so customers have really been dealing with that. So when they try, they start thinking about, well, maybe I need to go hybrid, maybe I need to. So they're out researching and looking to get a lot of help as they're trying to figure out how to go electric. And they've been looking at Ford and Ford Pro to figure out, well, can I get some help on the consulting of this? They need to figure out, and it takes months to get electricians to help install you know, the right type of chargers. How do they get this done with the city and permitting? And this takes, it can take six to nine months to get through that process. So they have real issues trying to install all of the software and the service to get all of that put together. They need a lot of support. They're yeah. out scrubbing YouTube, looking for the right support and help on that. So that's why we- Are uh, you, I'm yeah, sorry to I wanna sneak, I wanna sneak this, in, this last, in this last second based on everything you just said is AI becoming an important conversation because you realize you can map that and make it much more efficient for people? We have a team internally, they have a, we have a proprietary tool internally that is um, developing a solution for us. And it actually takes all of the Ford jargon and it yeah. has built on an AI platform that we're utilizing and actually um, building it to help us support our contact center. They're like, get off, Gary, get her out of here. She's talking too much. 
So yeah. that's actually something we're using for our contact centers to support, to develop it so that we can do better online support and um, working to integrate that into some of our online chat as well. Wanda, thank you. Thanks, Gary. That was great. I think it's Gary's electrician is calling him right now. Well, my boss. Yeah, I will. Oh, you got okay. okay, it. Soon. All right. That was lovely. Thanks to you both. Bye. Thanks, Gary, for joining. All right. It's time for Ryan Harwood. Ryan. Oh well, my God, up. Ryan. It's I feel like it's been too long, man. It's been a while. It has. It's been a while. It's good to have you back. Thank you. Before we spin off your own show here. <laughs> Ryan is the CEO of Gallery Media Group, our publishing entity at Vayner. And Ryan, I'm super fired up. Today we have Aleko Asketa, who's going to be joining us. Let's bring him up. He has quite a story. He's the VP of Marketing for Grey Goose North America. And after being eight years an entrepreneur, he's now come full circle back to Bacardi Limited where he started his career in 1998. That is so cool. Cheers to you, Aleko. Thank Thanks you. For us. How you doing, Aleko? What's up, Ryan? Everything good? Everything's great. Everything's great. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. Surviving this hideous weather down in Miami right now? Yeah, so we've actually had like three straight days of rain, which is uh, pretty uncommon for us. But, uh, you know, I see most of the year it's paradise down here. So no complaints. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually down here with you right now, which is why I'm looking out the window. and I'm like, Jesus, I have to go back to New York on Saturday. Give me something down here. Yeah. Well, it's good. It's good martini weather. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> awesome. Well, let's jump right into this. I'm excited to have you on because I'm a big fan of the brand. Um, you know, you've been with Bacardi for years how have you seen the company's viewpoint on audience change over the years? Yeah, no, great, great question. Cause it's a hot topic for us. Um, I really think like, honestly, as a whole, I, I don't think the audience per se has changed. I think the way we look at our business is we have to continuously always be recruiting into the, the brand. So audience stays the same. I think what's really changed is the way that we connect um, with the audience. You know, when I started, 20 years ago, I could do print ads, uh, the TV spot, and I'm reaching 90% of the audience that I want to. Now it's a lot more nuanced. And I think before we used to broadcast our message, now, now we really have to rely on a lot of other mediums, especially within social, um, working with influencers, um, and so we can connect um, with the audience that we're trying to, to recruit in a really relevant and organic way. Yep, makes total sense. And I know that music... It's a huge part of, of your marketing strategy for yeah. you. And, you know, you're the spirit of the Grammys. You know, tell us, what does that mean for the brand and consumer? And why did you choose that as a pillar? Yeah, for sure. So the Grammys, uh, we're going to go on. We're two years that we've been the official spirit of the Grammys. Uh, obviously, when you look at the Grammys, it really is like the Super Bowl of culture. Um, and really what goes perfect, I mean, consuming like you know high-end uh, spirits with music they it goes hand in hand it's a celebratory mo moment um I've, and for us we've all always um, really looked at music to, to celebrate creators expressiveness um and the grammys in particular is, is just an awesome event for us besides being such like a cultural moment uh it allows us to really have full on 360 activation, you know, from the event itself where we can serve our products. So we have a signature drink and the passion drop. We have content that we create specifically um, with them. And then we can also do broad reach media because I, I do still believe in TV. I think it, in the right time, it, it, it does allow you to have broad reach so we can actually advertise in show. Um, but what happens with TVs is, as, as you know, nowadays, you know, consumers really have a control. You can watch anything whenever you want. You can click on and off. But where they really do lean in, it's live sporting events or award shows like the Grammys. So, that, so that's why for us, it makes um, a lot of sense um, to do. Um, and then personally, just, uh, you know, because a lot of this is personal, too. I'm a big fan of music in general. And, uh, and it's, it's nice to be able to go to the Grammys and, and see your brand come to life there. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> Same reason that I show up to the, uh, the U.S. Open each year, which we'll get to exactly. in a little bit. You guys are a big part of that. Um, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about the rise of, of ready to drink and ready to serve cocktails. Like, how do you think about that trend rising and how is that going to impact your business overall? 
Yeah, no, I mean, it, it's been like a game changer really um, in our business because uh, I, I think um, especially when you look at a lot of people used to come into high end spirit or spirits in general through through beer. Um, but now what you're seeing is, you know, you have a lot of like spirit based RTDs or even like white claws and truly people are think that they're already, um, you know, have spirits in them. So that to me is like one, you're already like a step closer um, as well. Then the other thing that happened is uh, what RTS for people don't know, that's, that's more ready to serve. So that's not in the can. So that's like cocktails in a bottle and people really want to create that experience that they have in like a, a high end bar, um, for example, or a restaurant with a cocktail at home. Um, but our insights show, for example, there are 20 million Americans that own a martini shaker, but yeah. they're like intimidated to use it. It looks cool but they don't know how to use it. So we actually launched uh, this month uh, a Grey Goose Classic Martini in a bottle where we're really offering consumers a perfect martini every time, like in a bottle. So it's a really exciting innovation for us. Um, we think people will you know, want to do it because it demystifies the martini, but it's also very organic. It's not like we're creating something that's not part of the brand's DNA um, with the Grey Goose Classic Martini. Makes a lot of sense. You know, and, and I'm, I'm always interested in people's take on this. You know, you oversee a highly venerable brand. Um, yeah. How, you know, it's, it's been around a while. I, you know, even when I was in college, it was the hottest drink ever. Like, how do you remain relevant over time with such a venerable brand like Grey Goose? Yeah, I mean, really, that's uh, the crux of my existence uh, and day to day. So uh, I, first and foremost, it really starts like with the, the team, um, you know, as a middle aged person trying to recruit uh, new consumers to integrate into Grey Goose. Um, I, I need to have a team of like super smart, young, diverse that are a reflection of our consumer, you know, the consumers that we're actually, you know, trying to be relevant with. So it starts with that um, as well. And then, um, you know, I think you also have to be comfortable, like, seeding control, like, of your brand. Everything's not always going to be, like, totally on brand, on point. So that's why we work with, you know, influencers that, you know, they have their own audience, but th they want to speak to their audience, not in a brand voice, but in their voice. So you have to be comfortable with that. And then we also align um, with certain like cultural platforms. So we were partners with uh, LeBron James uh, and Maverick Carter's show, The Shop, on Uninterrupted. So it's basically really raw, open conversations. Um, but you have to be comfortable as a brand person that is, you're not always going to have be on brand, uh, like on message the way you would normally perceive it to be. But your message is coming across in a way that's relevant. Um, to the people that are taking in the show because they're tuning in to, to hear the conversations, not to learn about your brand. So your brand needs to be there in a way that's organic and authentic. Yep. And last question here before I do a quick speed round, you know, yep. I brought up the U.S. Open before. It's one of my favorite events of the year by far. Um, the Grey Goose Honey Deuce Cocktail is the drink of that event. It's made waves for a while just in culture in general i mean how did you get the brand so entrenched in a cultural event like that and and how does that impact the business or how you show up elsewhere at other events yeah i think um the us open we're going on year 17 with the partnership so consistency i think is a big part of it i think too many too, too often um brands will be in and out versus forming like long-term partnerships with brands um, the other great thing about the U.S. Open is unlike a football game or something where last call is, for example, at halftime, sometimes like the matches go into two, three in the morning. Um, so that also gives people an opportunity. At, I think we have a stat that a honey deuce is sold every three seconds uh, at the U.S. Open, which is pretty amazing. Uh, and we really didn't even realize how big of a part of the U.S. Open it was um, until the pandemic hit and there weren't audience uh, people allowed at the U.S. Open. So we actually created honey deuces to go in conjunction with the USCA. Um, and that also led now that we have like through cocktail courier, you can actually have honey deuces like ordered, uh, to your home. But yeah, it's been great. I mean, it's, uh, I don't think you can experience a U.S. open without a Grey Goose honey deuce. You cannot. All right. Awesome. Quick speed round. It's what I'm known for. It's the yep. only reason why these guys keep inviting me on to an interview people. So here we go. Early riser or night owl. Yeah. At, at this stage of my life, probably more of an early riser, even though I still probably go to bed a little later than I should. <laughs> so you're an always honor. Yeah. <laughs> right. Instagram or TikTok for personal consumption? 
Yeah, um, personal. I'm still probably a little more IG, but uh, but TikTok is very much a guilty pleasure that that I'll get sucked into quite often. You never leave home without. I live in Miami. I have to say my Ray Bans. Yeah, Ooh. I always got I always got to bring the shades with me. And lastly, how do you drink your Grey Goose? Oh, Grey Goose Martini uh, stirred with a twist. I love it. Aleko, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you, Ryan. That was fun. That was fantastic. I'm not going to forget that. That honeydew statistic is a, is a crazy it's one, right? Crazy. Whoa, I love those. All right, but let's bring another beverage brand up, shall we, Ryan? Let's go. All right, let's bring Michael Smith up. He is head of marketing for one of PepsiCo's newest brands, Starry, which is a lemon-lime soda, which is poised for major disruption. Michael, thanks for joining us. And if you can't tell, Ryan, he's he's calling in live from Hudson Yards. Let's go. He's in my thanks office right now. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> What's up, Michael? I'm um, doing well, man, and uh, happy to be here both virtually and physically. I love it. I love it. Michael, one of my favorite people in the marketing world. You remind me, you're a Knicks fan, right? Or no? Uh, I'm a Knicks fan, and it's been a good year. I'm excited. Yeah. I'm excited for Saturday night. Let's go Knicks. Just for everyone in the audience, you got to root for the Knicks. Absolutely. All right. Thanks for joining us today. I'm, I'm super curious to learn more about Starry, given how new it is and how you guys are thinking about the brand. You've made a big splash in a sport that I love. So, you know, tell me, you just launched this new soda brand. It's a very crowded beverage market. Tell me how you looked at platforms, how you looked at culture when you were preparing to launch Starry in order to inform your decision making. Yeah, it's a great question. And it's a crowded marketplace. And I think the first thing that we try to do is say, where are we trying to win? Um, and so we really focused on the lemon lime category, Starry's uh, lemon lime soda. So we said, first and foremost, let's win in our category. Um, and from there we can win more broadly in the beverage space. And then, you know, to your point around platforms, I think, you know, for us, it was about who's underserved, who's not being seen, who do we have an opportunity to create a real and authentic relationship with who's going to embrace our brand because you know the category is not talking to them brands aren't talking to them or brands aren't showing up there and so being you know a new brand to the marketplace we were looking for white space we were looking for white space from a platform perspective we were looking for white space from a consumer perspective and you know what we really saw um, when we started to peel the onion a little bit is especially in our category, there's one really dominant player. It's been around for a very long time, um, but it isn't necessarily representative of younger consumers in the marketplace. And so we said, you know, there's an opportunity where you, know, you don't necessarily want to have your mom's lemon lime soda. So there, there was a, an opportunity for us to act as a badge for a younger generation. And then we said, okay, you know, where do they live? Where do they spend time? And, you know, that became really easy for us. And so, you know, we looked at the TikToks, the reels, the, the YouTube shorts of the world and said, you know, we can win in this space where, by the way, our competitors aren't playing and where the consumer that we want to embrace is naturally living. Like, let's show up there and let's, break the playbook a little bit around how you would launch a soda brand, especially coming from, you know, a company like PepsiCo in order to authentically show up in the lives of those consumers. But that's really how we thought about it. I love it. And as I mentioned earlier, you guys chose the NBA, you chose All-Star Weekend to launch Starry in a big way. You know, what was the process like in, in which you picked that cultural event? And what were you looking to achieve throughout the weekend when you, when you went there? Yeah, you know, it's another great question. And there's... I mean, I guess it's an age old marketing tension, but it shows up in, in our world a lot. We want to be specific to a target consumer that, that we're really looking to act as a voice for. But we also have a responsibility as we think about how we need to grow our business to find the right mainstream platforms to drive awareness. And, you know, with Starry being a new to the world trademark, like there are not that many times where you get to launch something wholly new and like our innovation development process is almost 18 months long. So we're sitting with it, right? It, to us, it's not new. It's something that's existed for a really long time. And we have to remember that, you know, for consumers, every consumer that sees Starry this year, it's probably going to be the first time they interact with that brand. 
It's not a line extension. It's a truly new trademark. And so we needed to find the right place where we felt like we could be authentic to our audience, but also show up, you know, in a big way and, and on a large stage. And so we we felt that All Star Weekend was the right way to do that. Um, the NBA um, is the most impactful sports league amongst young consumers. Basketball is a lifestyle as much as it is a sport. Um, so we felt like it was the right place for Starry to be. And then the All-Star Weekend is the crown jewel of their season, maybe outside of the finals. And so there are all eyes on the NBA over the course of that weekend. So we felt like it was right from a target perspective. We felt like it was right from a scale perspective. And then we said, how do we go big? So we integrated across the board, everything from owning the three point contest to launching our first ad campaign to activating on the ground to giving out you know, almost a million samples of Starry um, to partnering with over 15 athletes over the course of the weekend. Like is like we're going to be at every touch point for people on the ground and for people tuning in. And so you weren't going to be able to miss us. And it was the right place for us to be. You know, as I scroll through TikTok, you know, there's there's so many beverage challenges, soda challenges, taste tests. You know, people are fanatic about what they drink. You know, how how do you keep relevant when the competition is this fierce in this type of category? <laughs> You know, it's a great question. I, I would I would throw that one back at you. Like you give me the answer. Um, no, <laughs> you know, it's uh, it's one of those things that for us like we don't know and so you have to you have to get yourself out of the historical marketing model of you're going to spend yeah. 6 months 9 months designing a campaign and you're going to think through every eventuality of that campaign and then you're going to push it out into the world and you know you're going to cross your fingers that that people accept it and that you hit uh, on something at the right time you know for us when we think about how to be successful on TikTok, how to break through given everything that's going on and the speed of culture is we've decided to do essentially two things. And those two things are based on you know, us accepting the reality that we don't know what's going to hit and we can't design something to hit every single time. And so we've done two, th two things. First, we've brought an entirely new process to our organization that allows us to you know, streamline the decision-making hierarchy in order to develop, produce, and publish content faster. Yep. Uh, so we've stripped away a lot of the obstacles and barriers to moving fast. Um, and that's really, really helped us. And then secondarily, we've decided that we're going to produce at volume and at scale because we have no idea like what's going to win. Um, there's nothing I find you know funnier than sitting in you know a creative review for social content. And it's just yeah. like, I don't know, man, like, let's do it. Yeah. Um, does, does it feel like it's relevant? Is, is there some buzz and some heat around it? Is it, you know, a conversation or a concept or an idea or a trend, you know, that we can have a unique point of view on? All right, let's do it. And let, Let's continue to test and learn like the TikTok algorithm is the biggest focus group probably in the history of marketing and let's yeah. leverage it as a focus group and let's continue to throw stuff at it um, to, to see what works and hopefully we get better over time but for us it was really about how do we operate at scale and then how do we structure our organization and our teams to allow for that um, yeah. and the more that we do that the more of an opportunity we have to be successful. Yeah, it's an it's an and statement, not an or statement. Keep creating, keep creating, and let let the algorithm tell you what consumers actually like. I love it. Um, last question here: Tell me about your own personal consumption habits and and just kind of interaction with culture. Like, where are you engaging with the culture of right now in order to you know try to just learn in general? You know, it's a, it's a great question, and I have found over the course of my career. Hopefully I've gotten better at marketing and I've probably gotten worse at culture. And the reality is, as we all get older, like that just kind of happens. Like yeah. I cannot, I can no longer trust myself to be able to look at something and say, that's cool. Like yeah. people are digging that. Like it, yeah. it's the reality of aging. And so I've tried to, to move away from that. And I now find myself more as a voyeur, voyeur of culture. Um, and so there, there are two things that are really important to me. And one, obviously, honestly, is more of a, mental health thing. I, I'm all about touch grass 
And like, you gotta just get outside and like spend time with people, spend time out in the world, in the physical world. Um, that to me is really important. It, it, it helps me from a mental health perspective, but still being able to see how people engage, you know, how they dress, um, how they behave. Like there's no, to me, there, there's no anecdote for actually being out in the world. And then yeah. secondarily, man, I'm, I'm scrolling TikTok. Like I really am. Um, and so the, the algorithm's fitting me for sure, but um, that's where culture is happening right now. And it's where I'm spending the most of my time. So it's talking to people in the real world and then scrolling. I like it. I like it. Awesome. Speed round for you time right now. Here we go. Are you an early riser or a night owl? I'm an early riser now, man. Again, like getting older. And so there's, there's nothing better than, you know, a coffee at 6 a.m. these days. Woo, I like it. Okay. Personal consumption. Are you spending more time on Instagram or TikTok these days? I spend more time in IG DMs and more time just broadly scrolling TikTok as an entertainment platform. Yeah, that's super interesting. Um, you never leave home without this. AirPods every day. Can't walk out the door without them. If I lose them, I'm going directly to the Apple store. Like have to be in my pocket. Last one, ice cubes or crushed ice? Whew. Okay. As a former athlete, if I'm icing a body part, crushed ice. If I'm putting ice in a drink, ice cubes. I love it. I love it. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate you. Let's go, Knicks. Absolutely, man. Appreciate it. I loved Ryan's face when he was talking about the crushed ice. It was like he couldn't wait to hear what your answer was. <laughs> and I don't, know, I don't know about the crushed ice thing for injuries. I got to try that. It's a good one. All it right. Is. It is. Well, can't thank you enough, both of you, for joining. This is fantastic. Thank you so much. Have Thanks, a good one. All right. We next up we have Chris Anthony, Chief Revenue Officer from Gallery Media Group. Hi, Chris. How are you doing? Hi, Andre. How are you? Good to see you. It's nice to see you too. Looks like you're mm -hmm. somewhere exciting. I'm not just at home, but just I need home. my own trademark lightning, lightning Ryan, like Ryan. He's like the oh, Ryan yeah. of the show. I need my own trademark I version of something. I know. Well, you know what? I think we let him do that. We'll do our own thing. Exactly. You're gonna have your own show. You're gonna do your own thing. Well, I, exactly. and yeah, and with you guys, you can actually produce it, so it's all good. All right, next we have June up. June Lee Ricer. She uh, she is the GM. I have to look at it because it's such a long time. T GM and EVP for the premium skincare division of Crown Laboratories. Jin, G, June is a skin expert and digital innovator with a proven track record for growth. June, I was blown away by some of the stories that you were telling me about the science and how you guys are looking at all kinds of areas that I wasn't even thinking about in my life. So we're very excited to have you on the show today. Thanks for joining. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. Hi, June. How are you? Good to see you. Great to see you. It's a beautiful day here in Dallas. So happy to be talking to you. I know in New York as well. It is spring is here. We'll take it. I'm excited. So it's be 83 in New York on Friday. So it's great. But yes, let's jump right in because we have lots of exciting stuff to talk about and so many of the great work that you're doing at the brand. Um, so much today is talking about obviously relevance and culture. But I think a lot of things have to obviously there has to be a North Star around a mission and a purpose. Talk a little bit about that and how that sort of gets you to relevance. Absolutely. Um, I am so proud to work on this amazing skincare brand called Strivectin. And mm -hmm. when we think about being relevant as a brand to our consumers, it really, I think, starts with what you stand for and having that vision and purpose and a true differentiated identity. And really proud to say also that Strivectin has stood the test of time. It's been around now for over 20 years as a science-based clinical efficacious brand that is helping consumers with skin skin health problems and really delivering powerful products with visible results. And I think that that is something that is so fundamental to the success of Strivectin. And when you have that North Star and the vision of how you're helping consumers with your products, that really drives everything. And it's been a growth engine for mm -hmm. us. Um, However, you still need to constantly be innovating. Yes, you know, you've got some power products in our portfolio. I'll give you an example, Chris. Mm -hmm. um, we have the number one neck cream 
in America. It's an amazing product for tightening um, and lifting the neck. A lot of consumers don't realize that the neck is so sensitive and we're bringing this amazing product. It's been out there for quite some time, but you can't rest on your laurels. In order to stay relevant with consumers, you wanna innovate. And certainly in prestige skincare, innovation is critical. Um, and so we took that platform to not just launch things that may be trendy, but don't necessarily tie to what your brand stands for. So we took the idea of a neck cream and we launched a neck roller serum in a different format um, for the neck and the jawline. Last year, it was one of the most successful new products in prestige skincare. So knowing what you stand for and having that North Star, but then constantly innovating, I think is absolutely critical to being relevant for consumers today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to your point, innovation goes so well with this topic and especially in the category, it's driving all the growth. So congrats on that and all the new product evolutions. Staying on the topic of innovation and sort of what that means in the platform space, talk a little about TikTok. I'm a little familiar, obviously, given our relationship on that platform, but what are you learning from that platform? What's it sort of teaching you guys about um, the consumers, the product? Talk a little bit about that platform specifically. Absolutely. TikTok is so great as a platform for listening and learning. Um, you know, one of the key pieces that our marketing team does really well is to listen to the conversations that are out there and being part of the conversation versus trying to create a topic that may not be as relevant. And so we use TikTok specifically to listen to what are consumers talking about? What are they engaging on? And in the world of skincare, it's incredible, Chris, how much education is sought after. Um, another example is there's a huge conversation on basic things like how to wash your face. Mm -hmm. What is the right skincare routine? What's the right order of products that you need to use? Um, huge debates in terms of cleansing, maybe double cleansing, adding eye cream, serums, moisturizers, SPF. And so one of the most successful TikTok videos that Strivectin um, launched in partnership with your agency um, was specifically talking about skincare routines, the right order, the right products, and that generated such an incredible conversation online. So TikTok is great, not just to have your brand message out there, but really to learn and engage in conversations that consumers are already having. And mm -hmm. makes everything feel easy in the complex world of some, some, some of these things. So yeah, it's such an amazing discovery tool in that aspect. On the same vein, obviously you guys are a global brand and have such great presence everywhere shopping and commerce and all that has just changed so much over the years, especially over the last three years. How does it work in terms of you really thinking about being relevant on all the different shopping behaviors and different channels? Talk a bit about that. Yes. Uh, one example I can talk about is our explosive growth in China. Um, mm -hmm. That is a market that we are growing in. And in terms of how we're engaging with consumers and shopping because Omnichannel has been out there for some time. And yes, we have a strivectin.com direct to consumer. We have brick and mortar. Our focus is specialty retailers, but in a market like China, live streaming mm -hmm. is critical. And we've seen incredible success by partnering with key opinion leaders, KOLs, mm -hmm. um, one in particular, Austin Lee. Um, mm -hmm. And we're leaning into those major uh, live streaming events like Double Eleven, Six Eighteen, where mm -hmm. you can sell thousands of units of Strivectin Double Fix for Lips in minutes. And so really just staying on top of where is the consumer and being everywhere she wants to shop. And in China, that means live streaming. Strivectin is a global brand and just staying on top of all the different platforms and engaging with how she wants to shop. Um, that's critical because there might be a new form of shopping opportunities going forward. There are a lot of things that we're really keen to just keep our eye on and be externally focused. This is something I really stress to my teams and I think we do really well, which is, yes, you want to really have internal conversations, processes and go to market strategies, but let's focus on the outside. Let's bring the outside in. Let's figure out what's important to the consumer, where is she shopping, be in those platforms. And then when it comes to influencers, KOLs in China, choosing the right ones that really have integrity and know your brand and authentically use your brand 
and love the brand and therefore can be a great um, advocate for your brand on platforms like a T-Mall um, live streaming event. So, so great. Um, the live shopping space is so interesting and fascinating. So it's so exciting. You guys are very obviously early on in the right space there. Last question. Obviously, we talked about TikTok and there's a lot of inspiration coming there. What else sort of inspires you as a, a leader, as a marketer from a, from a culture standpoint right now where you're getting some inspiration as you're thinking about what's next for the brand? Well, we're always looking at diverse audiences and consumers. I think that mm -hmm. one of the things that we're really excited about with Stride Becton is expanding our consumer audience. Um, we're looking at behavioral audiences, but we're also making sure that we're relevant across. And so staying close to consumers listening, whatever platforms they're on, we do a lot of social listening. That is critical for us because we have consumers that are seeking us for, let's say, anti-aging products, but we also just launched an acne range. So let's talk to those consumers who have blemish prone skin. They're on potentially different platforms and having different conversations. And so really just trying to expand our audience by listening and seeing how can our brand intersect with those needs. And because we stand for science and we stand for products that really work, um, our launches need to be super relevant. This year we're launching an acne range, also even a range for keratosis pilaris. So just staying mm -hmm. close to the consumer because that was rough and bumpy skin was a, was a need that we saw was out there. And um, there wasn't really a product and brand that had the integrity like Strivectin uh, to be able to address that concern of uh, rough and bumpy skin. So it's just exciting times to work on Strivectin and be part of um, you know, the prestige skincare space and just be relevant in today's um, culture. Yeah, it's so great. And just the, the amount of science and the work that goes in the brand is so incredible. So congrats to all that and all the amazing work and um, everything that's to come. But thank you so much for joining us today. Awesome. Thank you. It was fun. Thank you, June. The, the comments are going wild. You got a lot of, I think, some new customers that need to be checking out some things. Innovation is, is fantastic. I'm going for the neck thing. Absolutely. <laughs> Fantastic. Yes. Thanks for joining June. And thank you, Chris, as always. Thanks, Andrea. Have a we'll good one. see you soon. All right. Take care. And thanks all of you for joining us. We are going to be celebrating our three-year anniversary of Marketing for the Now on May 9th. We already have an outstanding lineup, so we hope you can make it 12 noon Eastern time. So sign up. And don't be shy. Let us know if there are other people you want on the show, uh, what topics might be of interest. And we can't thank you enough for joining us today. See you soon.